The views and opinions expressed in the following program do not necessarily reflect the policies and the position of Now You Know. Good evening and welcome to Viewpoint. Together with experts and newsmakers, we'll make sense of the week's biggest issues and stories. I'm Barnaby Lowe in tonight's conversation. Iloilo Representative Janet Garin, a former health secretary, has said that while she's currently a legislator, she doesn't stop being a doctor. To that end, she's advocated for mass testing. In May, she filed a bill that aims to bring down the cost and expand the country's COVID-19 testing capacity. Now, she's helping with efforts to make pulled testing possible. Outside of her grassroots and legislative work on healthcare, Karin has also made her stand clear on other issues, most notably the denial of ABS-CBN's broadcast license. And here with us live via Skype tonight is former Health Secretary and now Iloilo Representative, Congresswoman Janet Karin. Good evening, uh, Congresswoman Janet Karin. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and on this, um, I would say, eventful day. Good evening, Barnes. Thank you for inviting me. All right, let's let's get to it because um, there are a lot of healthcare issues that we must tackle. And, I, you know, I, I know that um, your advocacy in the last uh, months, all throughout this pandemic, has been mass testing. And so we'll talk about that later. But I'd like to start, if you don't mind, with your comments on what has happened today. The day started with medical professionals, medical frontliners, medical societies, dozens of them holding a webinar calling for a return to ECQ for two weeks, only for two weeks. Are you for a return to ECQ given what you are seeing in our hospitals, what you are seeing on the ground as you work your way through your mass testing efforts? If we're going to do something should be done. You cannot just go on an ECQ and then waste that moment or waste the two weeks. Even if we go on an ECQ and we do nothing, then we won't be able to achieve or coexist with COVID. The point here is that it's not easy to eliminate this virus, but what we should do is to allow ourselves to coexist with the virus. And that would actually be a combination of two things. First, cooperation among our people. Four to the second, expanded massive testing where results should be within 48 hours. And very, very important. Testing should actually be something that we give to our people at a very low cost. That is, it has become a country. For other countries, there is actually a cap. There is a cap in terms of testing cost. In our country, um, because there's a need, Many people are taking advantage and many people are exorbitantly charging. Third, well, we do test and test and test people and we get a lot of positive. Most of them are asymptomatic, some are mildly symptomatic. The bigger question here is where do they go? So the isolation centers should be in place. They should be spent to, this should be supported, facilitated and operated by our government. Testing can be a partnership between the private sector, mm -hmm. local government units, and those are really the, the laboratories, both private and government. Ma'am, you're, you're breaking up a little bit, but um, from what I understand, from what you said, um, there are certain conditions that have to be met before we decide to go back to ECQ. But, okay, so, but the medical professionals, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they, they also actually set these conditions, but they want it to happen faster. 
But the reaction, the initial reaction from was that the ECQ before had already served its purpose. And therefore now we should concentrate on other strategies like localized lockdowns and um, expanded testing and strengthened contact tracing, all of which you, you mentioned. But the initial reaction was we do all of those without reverting back to ECQ. Is that something that also makes sense to you? In, in public health, we have to balance public health and the economy. Because we are talking, we are talking here not only about COVID, but other illnesses as well. The rainy season has arrived. We were not successful in really testing substantial number of population. We still need more isolation centers. Maybe, um, of course, time and again, two words. We're the solution for COVID, that it's speed and unity. And we all have to work with utmost speed, decide how to move forward and coexist with the virus and act as a United Nation. Um, uh, the, the problem that we are seeing now is that people who get tested, people who will realize that they have a positive member in their family, do not know where to bring their patient. The second is the huge financial cost because we affecting families, not individuals. And when you talk about the testing cost of, let's say, 5,000, 8,000, 10,000, and you have to test all members of the family at the point where many businesses are closing down, where people are losing jobs, where people are also hungry, it will be very difficult. So balancing health and the economy is a big challenge. If we have a, um extensive NCR lockdown, I'm not sure how our people will survive if the government will not subsidize everything. But subsidizing everything is also a big challenge. If we can go on a city per city lockdown with massive testing and making an assurance that those who will test positive will be isolated and a minimal amount, or let's say a social amelioration fund can be given to their families. So that while this patient is in the quarantine or isolation center, maybe a 5,000 family subsidy can be given to the family so they can have food in their table and they can have money for their basic needs. In that way, we'll be able to coexist with the virus. Mm. So a lot of ifs, but do you think that those ifs are workable? Because it seems like, and it sounds like to me, this is a very urgent SOS from our medical frontliners. In other words, they, they can't do it anymore without a, which, you know, they use the term timeout. Kailangan na raw nila ng timeout talaga. Otherwise, hindi na raw talaga kakayanin. There are two things here. We do understand the predicament of the frontliners. I've seen them, I've talked to them, and yes, the hospitals are really overwhelmed and many of them do not know where to get the subsidy for the patients that are being admitted mm -hmm. on the other hand you have here a bigger problem a similarly a similar problem whose basic need in terms of food medicines non-covid illnesses have to be attended to balancing both actually means allowing us to coexist with the virus and that's immediately separating the positives from the negatives, putting a cap on the cost of testing. Why is it that other countries has a maximum ceiling of testing? They would, China has it at $20 max. The others would charge $10. Singapore, I've heard, is $40. Vietnam is $30. Korea is the same at $30. Why is testing very expensive in the Philippines? Nobody is coming out, putting his foot forward and telling the COVID testing centers, hey, mm -hmm. bring down your price. It's, it's, it's not a want, it's not a luxury. You cannot exist with COVID if you make testing available to those who cannot afford it. Mm -hmm. So, um, pagkakaintindi ko sa inyo, 
siya sa pinakamalaking problema natin dito. Hindi yung klase ng community quarantine na meron tayo. Uh, for you, the bigger problem here is uh, mass testing effort, which is expensive and not enough for the number of cases that we are seeing right now. And ma'am, I mean, there's even this tussle over the definition of mass testing. And I mean, it, it's kind of unbelievable that after months already of this pandemic taking over our lives, there is still this debate going on over what exactly mass testing means. We the first step that should have, but um, since we are already at the situation, moving forward, we just have to live with what we have now and uh, act with speed. We should we should move faster. We should act faster. The initial approach was to test only the symptomatics, which was actually wrong, because in COVID, 90% are either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. It's very difficult to distinguish the two. So you only have 10% here who have moderate or severe COVID and therefore are symptomatic and can be identified. If you focus your testing on this 10%, you are one step behind. If you test and look and search and attack COVID in its habitat, and that's uh, our bodies, then you will be able to intercept the transmission of COVID. It's a very big problem if we just wait for COVID to attack us vis-a-vis versus attacking COVID where it is hiding. Because okay. in order to intercept the transmission, we have to know where they are. So you go back on who do we test? We, have, we, we need to test all the health frontliners. We need to really determine and to check who will pay for their testing. We need to implement pool testing. We are doing that now. We will be done with the initial results by next week. But we have to have discussions now. Will this be implemented in government hospitals, in private hospitals, who pays for the cost of testing? Will it be subsidized? Why is PhilHealth reimbursing expensive testing in many hospitals? If you cannot afford a test simply because it's being made available but not affordable, then forget testing. And now if you're making testing available and you have a lot of positive patients, we should have a place where to isolate these positives. Because if you test and you don't have any place to bring these patients, then you will end up with people not wanting to test. And then there will be mistrust. And when mistrust sets in during a pandemic, it's very difficult to move forward. So going back, we have to coexist with the virus, with health and the economy balancing so much so that there will also be minimal non-COVID deaths. We need to test, yes, but we need to immediately isolate and whatever social amelioration program we have, we families of those who test positive. In that way, you can entice them to go to an isolation center because they will not worry about the food of their children and about the needs, the basic needs of their family left there because they are not working. Are, are you saying, ma'am, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but are you saying that we've been doing it all wrong? No, it's, it's not really perfect because it's a pandemic, but there are rooms for improvement. We just need to work together fast, speed, 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 and acting okay. with unity and with a clear direction is very, very important in a pandemic response. So urgency, right? So a lot of people are reacting that, you know, President Duterte did uh, say through Secretary Harry Roque just a few hours ago that the IATF should take up this concern of our medical frontliners. And, and Senator Lorenzana said to reporters that they will take it up, but they will take it up on Monday. And a lot of people online on social media reacted to this and said, you know, why Monday? Why not now? Action needs to be taken now. We have not privy as to the reasons to that, no? but um, I, I believe 
if if uh, if the executive is saying they have a plan, it's uh, important to convey that plan to the people because bringing the trust of the public on a very important institution, which is the department, is key to resolving a pandemic. The government alone cannot solve the problem. Private sector alone cannot solve the problem. We have to address the mistrust, show the people where the direction is leading to, what are the specific obligations. If private sector will subsidize or pay for the testing of the people, then government should make testing affordable and available. Mm-hmm. And government... You, you said uh, multiple times now that um, that government and our people need to work together, right? And uh, yes. some of our officials said that pasaway daw yung mga Pilipino. Do you agree with this? But before you answer that, ma'am, uh, we will take a break because uh, I think uh, we, we're having a signal problem. So we will repeat the call um, and we'll take a, a minute or two break right now and then come back. All right. So to our viewers, we'll be back in, in a minute or two. back. Well, welcome back to Viewpoint and we still have a Congresswoman from Iloilo, Janet Green, also former Health Secretary. We'll pick up where we left off, ma'am. Um, I was asking you about, you know, comments that have been made over the last few weeks that because you you mentioned that the government and the Filipino people need to work together to be able to beat COVID-19. But um, some officials have said that Filipino pe- Filipinos, the ordinary Filipinos, are pasaway. So, pasaway nga ba ang mga Pilipino? Yes and no, no? He, because we cannot just generalize everybody. Um, yung iba, it's simply because they understand it. Others are not following things because it, uh, medical terminologies has not been laymanized to them. On the other hand, we have a lot of Filipinos who would like to coordinate, to cooperate with what is being said. Unfortunately, if you have children to feed, if you have a family to feed, if you have parents who are sick, if you, if there, if in a country where the out-of-pocket expenditure is high, you have to go out and work. But that's their frame of mind. Because they say, "Okay, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this." Pero wala na kaming makain. So it's, um, we go back to the issue of what is the problem. The pro- problem here is COVID. How do we attack COVID? First, we coexist with COVID, but we intercept the transmission. And intercepting transmission means allowing us to see where COVID is. But we cannot do that because we just have a lot of testing centers where the cost is very expensive. If we bring down the of testing, and if we allow people who are positive to be immediately isolated, then we will be able to live with the virus 
while waiting for a vaccine. Okay. You mentioned pool testing as, as one strategy to bring down the cost of testing and expand the capacity as well of testing. What exactly is pool testing? Pool testing means you swab, you collect the specimen from a group of, let's say, 10 or 5 people, and you used one testing kit for that. The good thing about that is it maximizes the capacity of a laboratory, and at the same time, results will be generated faster. The caveat here is that if we have innovations that will allow the cost of testing to be reduced, but we have testing centers who are still going to charge exorbitantly, then we are left with no solution. We cannot just give options, but then allow laboratories to charge it at a high cost. But mm -hmm. another reason that they are charging it at a high cost, because some of the suppliers are also selling the kits at a very high cost. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. if, if I could just okay, you, you break. Yes, ma'am. Um, you you broke up a, a little bit towards the end, but let me just clarify. So, yung pool testing po. Um, you're saying one test kit for five people, ten people, or twenty people. It could be as many as twenty people, right? Uh, so paano po yes. kung isa Paano po kung isa doon sa 20 people na yon or dalawa negative? So hindi yun po yung medyo hindi ko maintindihan. How 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 will they be differentiated or isolated from the other ones who are positive? Kung isa lang po yung test kit. Okay, if you so uh, let's say 1000 1, people in swabbing 1000 people, we know that the prevalence in that area is let's say say so meron kang 20 na positive mm -hmm. pooling then means 100 tests one test groups of 10 because mm -hmm. you have 20 positives you presume that there will be 20 tests at the most that will be positive so dun sa 100 pag tinest mo yan 80 magiging negative which translates to 800 negative results. The positive 20 will now be subdivided into pools of five. Mm -hmm. The 25 is 100. Mag ma ma hanap mo doon yung pools of five na negative. Again, you eliminate and do individual tests. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is instead of performing one thousand tests you will only be doing 120 tests there's a huge reduction in cost turnaround mm -hmm. time will be faster mm -hmm. and you will be getting your result in 48 hours and this is this is feasible now i mean we can start doing this tomorrow or on monday because because from what i know they're already doing this in, in other countries we have to make sure that the test that being done is uh, commensurate with the guidelines of at least 90 accuracy and not much changes in the cycle. We can do it on the third week of August simply because we're still finishing the research now. But we need more laboratories to be one with us in bringing down the cost because once we cascade, the findings and the output of that research, if the hospitals will still charge exorbitantly, then we cannot arrive at the decision. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, we'll learn, um, I paid 6500 for my swab test, and it's upfront payment. So hopefully, we'll learn upon ganon. It's because, you know, I might be able to afford it, but I'm not sure that Filipinos will be able to afford that. And parang hindi ganung claim sa field health or other insurers yung cost ng test. So it's really a problem. Yeah. 
guidelines, the cost of testing without pool testing, if you do individual testing, the cost should just range between 2,000 to 2,500 pesos. That's doable. The problem here is if you buy, if uh, suppliers are selling the test kits at a very expensive price, then everything else comes out to be expensive. That's why the Department of Health should come forward, put a price ceiling on COVID testing and other supplies related to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Let, let's go to that the cost you know I, I was going to ask you about that later because some senators have called for a special audit of the covid-19 funds madami pong inutang billion po inutang to to fight covid um, augment the financial aid that would be given to people who would lose their jobs to people who would just be staying home and would lose their income as well as to support our frontline health workers and nandiyan din po siya yung cost ng testing so you keep on repeating na sobrang mahal po yung testing natin dito sa Pilipinas so are you for that the special audit of uh, covid-19 costs and if you are for that what exactly needs to be checked what exactly needs to be investigated which part of um the funds that have been used over the last few months? First and foremost, well, an investigation is a prerogative of the centers, especially so if it's public. Unfortunately, at the, in the midst of this pandemic, it will actually affect the response of uh, the government hospitals or the Department of Health or whatever agency will be affected. So when it's uh, it's something that is in place and should be done, but the timing should uh, be at the point where it will not affect our COVID or pandemic response. But again, we go back. There will only be abuses in terms of procurement if there is no ceiling as to the cost of commodities, supplies, and other devices needed in a pandemic response. So putting a ceiling in a pandemic is very normal. The leadership should just put their foot forward and implement a price ceiling. But are you saying that you are seeing signs of abuse of how the fund has been used? In other words, are you seeing signs of possible corruption? I haven't really seen um, the documents. It's very difficult to comment. Um, it's best. Um, it's best that um, prior to accusations being made, it's best to really look at the documents and decipher whether abuses have been committed. Okay, I see. Uh, I'm I'm going to go back to mass testing, you know, because um, you said in conjunction with mass testing, there has to be proper isolation as well as proper contact tracing. Now, recently, the police came out and said that they would hire, uh, I don't want, really want to use the term, you know, because it's a bit uh, a bit sexist, but but they said, chismosa daw ang gagawin na contact tracers. Uh, what do you think about this? And what do you think about the current contact tracing strategy and efforts um, because Mayor Magalong also uh, just recently said that only 1% of all LGUs, just 1% have effective contact tracing strategy. That is a very dismal number, isn't it? It's a very dismal number. Two things, either some wouldn't know how to go about it and they need to be helped at. Another thing is that it's also possible that simply because they are not that confident that they are prepared in terms of where to put the patients or how to deal with positive patients, then some will actually refuse testing. So if you ask me about contact tracing, contact tracing will be very useful 
in the situation where there was a lockdown, if if we talk about human human beings being made as a, being used as contact tracers, but now that we have opened, it should be a combination of contact tracers. But the solution to that is actually technology. Technology-based applications will now be very important because it will be very difficult to trace somebody. Let's say if I turn out positive, but mm. I left my home, I went to the terminal, took a tricycle, went to the bus station, then went, rode a jeepney to my office. Coming out of the office, I went to the supermarket, went back, rode the tricycle again, took the MRT, and then I arrived home. Imagine the dilemma that you have to do. That's not mm. easy to do for a human contact tracer. That's why be, that was that was applicable before during the initial lockdown. Now that we have opened, the solution there is to rely on technology-based applications. What we need to do is mandate enrollment in the applications that are already available, because it has been made often. Many people are not enrolling, so it's very difficult to trade contacts. Mm-hmm. So, hindi yung pwede yung mga chismosa, in other words. Hindi kasi siya ganun kagali, kasi nag-spread na siya eh. I mean, nagbukas na tayo, nagbukas na tayo. Hindi mo naman masusundan yung isang tao kung saan siya pumunta. But then if you have a technology-based app, or even if your phone will have that component na malalaman mo kung sa mga pinuntahan mo, Meron bang nagpositibo? Then, uh, that's the way to do it. Because come to think about it, we do not have unlimited funds. Mm -hmm. There is a limit to what government and the private sector can afford. And if you're talking about contact tracing and isolating people, we have to choose where we are going to invest. What is very important, ang daming kaso, hindi nga niya alam paano siya nahawa o saan siya nahawa. Ang importante ngayon, Saan mo dadalhin yung pasyente? Saan mo na hospital mo ilalagay? Saan yung isolation centers? Sino yung gagastos? What will be the counterpart of the LGUs? What will be the counterpart of the private sector? What will be the obligations of the national government? Mm-hmm. And in relation to that, ano, uh, because medyo na surprise po yung mga tao when the DOH um, released the number of recoveries um, not 38,000 just recently and some doctors are actually um, some experts are saying na tama naman tama naman tama naman daw yun um, kasi daw ginagawa na daw yun sa ibang bansa yung ganong sistema na pagka after 14 days na from the onset of symptoms or from the date of the swab test at mild or asymptomatic naman, that they would already be considered uh, recovered. But I'm going to quote from uh, infectious diseases expert uh, from UST Hospital, Dr. Benjamin Ko, because while he agreed, while he agrees to this in principle, I, I think his problem is with the medical surveillance. Because he's saying, I'm, I'm just going to read from what he said. He says, who do you contact, trace, and track and isolate if you don't know where they're from from the get-go? Because daw po, hindi daw po kompleto yung information ng DOH. And then he further says, the question is, did they really get better? Because if you don't know where they are, how will you know that they actually got better or if they died? So, while, while he agrees daw po doon, um, meron siya mga questions na ganyan. I, I, I wonder what's your take on this? Because madami pong, madami pong na, na surprise eh. At maraming, maraming doubtful, uh, including senators, including some other public officials. You know, Barnes, what's happening is that there's already a point where there is mistrust on the Department of Health. Alam mo yung pasunod-sunod, and then we have a very aggressive social media. Maski totoo yung sinasabi, hinahaluan na ng pagdududa. 
And that's very difficult in the face of a pandemic. So if you will ask me if the data is reliable, I would say yes. Better late than never. But the problem there is before announcing that, you have to prime the people because COVID is an evolving virus. It's an evolving disease. And now scientists are saying that the viral density or yung parte, yung, yung, uh, yung punto, kung saan nakakapanghawa talaga yung virus, is actually three to four days before the first day of uh, onset of symptoms up to the first five days. Ibig sabihin kapag may sintomas ng pasyente or kung nagpositibo na ang pasyente, after a maximum of 10 days, the patient is not infectious anymore. And I believe this is the premise where they are coming from. The, the only problem here is that mistrust grew over the weeks. Mm. There is mistrust. There is also fault finding. Tama naman yung nagkukumento ng iba, but then mahirap then on the part of the DOH. I mean, I mean if, if wala kang pagpipilian eh. But now is the time that the DOH should be aggressive, but at the same time, maski maraming reklamo ang ating taong bayan, kailangan bigyan natin ng pagkakataon kasi mas lalo tayong lulubog. So we just have to encourage them to move faster, come out with a concrete direction and decision, and allow many people to help. Kasi kung ang titingnan naman natin, yung sinasabi nilang DOH does not have the data, I believe the gap there is from the testing centers that mushroomed right and left. There is the gap on data collection because DOH will just be dependent on what will be submitted to them. But if the laboratories are not submitting, you know, magiging problema. That's why the Department of Health should immediately put a stop to expensive COVID testing, look at the procedures, equip all government hospitals, and allow testing to be something for both the rich and the poor. It cannot be an expensive commodity. Okay, so th there is a communication problem, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, pe people have observed that it's not only coming from the DOH, but it's also coming from President Duterte himself. So, for instance, President Duterte has said twice already that you can Time, his uh, spokesperson, Secretary Harry Roque, explained it away, saying that it was just a joke. But then President Duterte, for the second time, he repeated it and then said that it wasn't just a joke. So, I mean, as a medical professional and as a former health secretary, well, what do you think about this? I, I, because I think there's no question that that's false. Um, and professionals have come out to say, false you can't do that but you know the president saying things like this is, is that is that a problem i really don't know what the intention is it can be two ways either he wanted to lighten the mood of the people because everybody is already everybody is not with the way covid is hurting our economy and our way of life and our jobs where the way COVID is depriving many people of food and the opportunity for public health treatment or health attention. I don't know what triggered that, but of course, um, uh, for those who understand, they might con conceive it as a joke. But the problem there is for people who might believe in it and do it, then that becomes a problem. Yeah, that's that's really a problem. But the other thing that um, he kept on repeating, um, even during his sauna and also during his uh, uh, public address that aired on Tuesday morning, is uh, was it Tuesday morning or was it Wednesday morning? I'm, I'm not even sure about it anymore. Um, but he kept on repeating that there is going to be a vaccine or that he believes that there is going to be a vaccine available by either September or December. And he's 
seems to be pinning our hopes on this vaccine. So parang ang lumalabas na parang this is the main plan is to is to wait for the vaccine. I mean, what do you think about this? I mean, I know this is, um, pardon me, I know, I know this is kind of a touchy issue for you, you know, the, the issue of vaccines. But I think it's also a little different from Nimvaksha because at the time there was a vaccine. Nimvaksha was there. But now we're talking about, about the vaccine that still isn't there. So, um, yes. I was trained in advanced vaccinology. So I'm a vaccinologist. Okay, ma'am. The way vaccines are developed, it's over several years. But since this is a pandemic, it will be similar to the time where the flu vaccine was developed. And it really takes time. Because then Vaxia was developed over a period of 24 years. Polio vaccine was developed over a period of eight years. And not only that. It would take time to manufacture vaccine. Maybe the earliest would probably be like six months or eight months. So after the research or after the experimental phase, you have to proceed to manufacturing it and making it available for public consumption. Probably the president was referring to the timetable where two vaccines who are in the forefront will either commence or have a glimpse of a uh, hope in, in terms of being able to reach stage 3A. But remember, we passed a universal healthcare law, which is somehow flawed, first because we incorporated a provision there that calls for a phase four stage before you can implement any vaccine or any medicine or any device for that matter. That will actually mean that all countries will have to use it for five or 10 years before the Philippines can do it. So first, the universal health care law should be amended. That's a must. Second, everybody is racing to find a vaccine for COVID. But it's not that easy. Because in vaccination, there are three components of your body that responds. There is what you call the macrophages, the T cells, and the B cells. It can be a single dose, it can be two doses, it can be three doses. The scientists will tell us at the appropriate time. September will be very close. December, we might just have the initial results of stage 3A, but then that's again too tight because stage 3A is usually where many vaccine developments fail. 80% of vaccines being developed fails at stage 3A because you now have a bigger population with a, with, a, a, with a subject that has coexisting illnesses or comorbidities, and it's being given across all ages. Bottom line, it's very good to hope and pray that the vaccine comes, but we cannot just sit down and wait for the vaccine. We have to be able to coexist with the virus while waiting for the vaccine or for a medicine that will really cure COVID. Mm -hmm. But do you get a sense that that's, you know, that that's the plan of the president? That because uh, because he's mentioned it not just once and he mentioned it not just twice, but he's, you know, every time he um, does his public addresses, he mentions it. Maybe as a, as a government um, leader, he would like to give hope to the people because in a pandemic, hopelessness usually sets in. Uh, but uh, being a part of the group who is doing the research and pool testing, I also understand that we have been, uh, he, uh, the, the word of support for pool testing is being conveyed to us. And the private sector also being enticed to help. Uh, meaning the plan on pool testing, expanded massive testing is there. We just need to prepare because we have been informed about this just recently. And uh, the, the, the question now is, where are we or what are the plans in terms of providing more isolation centers? Because that will okay. actually... Mm -hmm. I, we don't have much time anymore, so I'm going to move on to uh, somewhat related, but it's more uh, legislative work. Um, because President Duterte in his sauna um, mentioned helping business 
as you know interest free loans and all that but um, after his sauna congresswoman stella kimbo said that you know president duterte was talking about a rice bill but not really talking about a rice bill and then and then of course the senate has just passed uh bayanihan 2 and it, it amounts to 140 billion pesos but senate he said that he wants the amount to be raised to 500 billion pesos. But a rice bill has um, 1.3 trillion pesos pegged for the entire um, economic recovery plan. Um, so where are you on this? Do you think, do you think that um, in the end, I mean, what do you think is needed? Which bill is needed for an economic re recovery or, or, or to battle COVID-19? The need is quite huge. If the question is what is the need, we, it can be more than trillions. But the question there is that how much can the government afford? And what are the priorities of expenditure? Are we wasting money? Is money going to corrupt practices? Are there procurement that needs to be checked? These are all questions that should be answered because in a time of a pandemic where every country is struggling to survive, what is very important at this point of time is that every peso, every penny spent is spent wisely. So the problem is the Bayanian law, of, yes, the rights bill is very important. We have passed it on third reading. But what we are hearing is that the government is also conveying how much it can afford. Mm. It's well, very important. Yeah, 140 billion pesos and 1.3 trillion pesos are a world apart. So is it possible to come, come to a middle ground, say 500 billion pesos, as Senator Zubiri suggested? That is for Secretary Dominguez to really answer because passing laws, I mean, we've passed a lot of laws, but if it remains unfunded and the economic managers still do not know where to get the funds for that, then it becomes a problem. That's why every peso being borrowed should be spent wisely. We cannot just keep on borrowing for public health expenditures that doesn't really reach to the grounds. We cannot be borrowing money for advocacies. We cannot be borrowing money for wants. We need to borrow money for our needs. Needs mm -hmm. where pricing is again reduced reasonably. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have uh, one last set of uh -huh. questions and I, I hope, yes, I have one last set of questions and I hope you don't mind because I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you about ABS-CBN because you voted against the renewal of its franchise and then subsequently you um, commented that you were promised, the government promised that the 11,000 employees of ABS-CBN would be taken care of and that they would not go unemployed. But now they're unemployed and now you, you're seeing, and I'm sure you, you've seen this ma'am, um, you're seeing um, at, at least who, who died because you know she was depressed and and then she suffered a, a heart attack. So, but, but what, what do you mean when you said? Because we have to clarify this because I I, I don't think that that was um, that that comment was uh, clear enough. What do you mean the government promised that of ABS-CBN would be taken care of? Barnes, the discussion during the time was about cities in Metro Manila who wanted to learn more about pool testing. It was a meeting wherein mayors were listening to the output of the research that we were doing and the intention was to bring down. The now, um, uh, when the issue was diverted, a possible conflict of interest between my being a legislator and author, of course, it was a very difficult situation. Be that as it may, my, as a legislator, I have tasks. But as a public health expert, as a vaccinologist, and as somebody who has been advocating to reduce public health expenditures and making public health 
affordable to both those who can afford it and those who does not have it. Health equity was actually what was being discussed. So moving forward, I cannot just abandon my being a doctor and a public health expert simply because I'm a member of Congress. In Congress, there are legislative steps and measures that are being done based on what is proper and what are the guidelines with no abuses. Ibalik po natin, Barnes, yung usapan sa pandemia at sa COVID. In this COVID, there are two kinds of groups making the response. One group is helping us because they really want to help us. But on the other hand, there are also groups pretending to help us, but actually becoming opportunists in terms of taking advantage of this pandemic. At yun yung sinabi ko kanina, if we have loans, if we have government expenditures, if we add on taxes, that money should be spent wisely. There should be price ceiling on everything that we are spending in relation to the pandemic. We cannot just borrow money right and left, but spend it on exorbitant services, on exorbitant expenditures, on exorbitant plans that are not actually giving us a concrete direction. Bumalik po tayo, tutuganan na po natin ang COVID if we move forward in one direction. My being a doctor, my coming out to help, and my participation in bringing down the cost of testing. You were complaining about a test cost of 6,500. Others are charging it at 10 or 12,000. But the laboratories that they set up with the 25 million pesos given by donors, including some of your friends, we were able to set up 11 laboratories. How much are we charging? We are charging 1,100 to 2,000 pesos, depending on the nationality of the patient. Results are out within 48 hours. My point is this. If we are going to divert a discussion and prevent me as a doctor and as a public health expert in helping our country in the midst of this pandemic, then I will not be standing up to my mantra as a doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, well, with all due respect, ma'am, I'm not, I'm not diverting the, the discussion, but I'm, I'm just trying to clarify. I, I, I was not referring to you. I was referring to the situation. Because mm -hmm. discussion you on, no? And uh, mayors were very much happy because they were mm -hmm. telling us that they cannot just absorb all the problems in the local government situation. And ano ba ang nagiging problema? It's not only COVID. Many people are now having leptospirosis. The rainy season has set in. And so this was the point of the discussion. The question that was being asked to me was that a conflict of interest kasi nasa Congress ka, pero tumutulong ka naman dito sa kalusugan. Will I just sit down simply because I'm a legislator and I'm not part of the executive? Of course, no. Because just like you, I've seen you help in many ways. Just like the people that you are working with, lahat tayo nagtutulungan. Because at the end of the day, this is about our country, our world against COVID. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pero para malinaw lang, ma'am, pasensya na po. Ano po ba talaga yung sinasabi ninyong pinangako? I mean, was there a step-by-step -step plan that the executive gave you before you voted against the renewal of the franchise of ABS-CBN for you to say na, Yung 11,000 workers will be taken care of. Yeah, Barnes, I will go back to, to the discussion. Um, the, siguro, ang mas maganda dyan, um, we pull out all the discussions in uh, the several hearings that were conducted and we present it to you. Kasi mahirap kasi na ngayon, if I say something and that, that will again be taken out of context, mas magiging mahirap because I will be tied and answering all of these questions instead of fast-tracking the research that will actually make testing available and affordable. My thrust now is in the next three, four, five days is to come up with a definite costing and achieve our goal that PCR testing will only be 350 pesos, a maximum of 450 pesos per patient tested with results out in 48 hours. So, um, yan po ang pag -usapan. On the issue of uh, my tasks as a, as a legislator, franchises 
comes with many other colatilia when a power is given to an institution or a businessman. When a conglomerate is given a huge task and you have the monopoly of bringing out new news, that monopoly, that obligation comes with responsibility. And I think that was the focus of the discussion. Okay. All right. Well, let's leave it at that then. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Congresswoman Janet Garin. We, we appreciate your time and we appreciate your expertise as well. And thank you so much to our viewers for watching Viewpoint tonight. Of course, Viewpoint airs every Saturday on Now You Know PH at 6 p.m. Again, my name is Barnaby Lowe. This is Viewpoint Now You Know. <laughs>